Vou começar. So hello, I'd like to welcome all our guests, our students, our professors today here at FGV. Uh, we have the honor today of receiving one of the greatest thinkers in management in, uh, in the last, it's not an exaggeration to say maybe 30 years. So Professor Mintzberg has been at least on the spot for at least 30 years that I remember when I was an uh, undergraduate student and we were already reading books from Henry Mintzberg. And now I still here, still debating, still steering the, the most interesting discussions on, on management and on, not all, only on management, but the whole society. So today we'll have Professor Mintzberg talking to us for about half an hour on, uh, on, a, on his uh, latest book on rebalancing society. And then we will we open for, for questions uh, and to, to have a, a session as lively as possible uh, in a more open and informal way. So, Professor Mintzberg, thank you very much. And it's up to you now. Good, thank you. Maybe we can stop the... It's very disconcerting when, when I'm introduced by someone who says, uh, he used my books as a student and now he's got gray hair. <laughs> and it was even worse when, um, please, no. Um, and um, um, it, it started really when I, when I began to teach the children of my original students. Now suddenly it's the grandchildren of my original students, so it, it gets, it gets very disconcerting. Um, uh, I am a great fan of FGV. Uh, we have been partners for, what, five years uh, in our international masters in practicing management and the class, uh, some of the members of the class are in fact right here uh, today because uh, our program goes around the world um, and it has one module of 10 days in each of five places in England and in Canada. Uh, then in Bangalore, in India, then in Beijing, China, and finally finishing here in uh, here in Rio de Janeiro, which um, which uh, I think is not only the most beautiful city in the world, but I couldn't tell you what's number two. Uh, <laughs> it's so far ahead of every other one that I can't imagine a, a, a number two. Um, um, so I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to be here in this kind of situation. Um, I'm also a big fan of Brazil. Um, uh, and I'd say that not just because I'm in Brazil. Um, there, there used to be a, a comedian, a Danish comedian, um, and he would say, it's such a pleasure to be in Ottawa. <laughs> uh, um, but I know where I am. I'm in Brazil, and I know that I'm in Rio, uh, and I know that I'm in uh, FGV. Uh, so it's uh, so it's wonderful to be here. Um, I I am a fan of Brazil, um, despite the problems that are going on now. Uh, um, and and frankly, um, there's a lot of focus on corruption in Brazil. Uh, not only within Brazil, but there's also a focus on the corruption in Brazil in other countries. Uh, I think to some extent uh, other countries are sometimes out to get Brazil, out to punish Brazil. After all, you had the nerve to elect a left-wing government yet again. Uh, and you're not supposed to do that in today's world. Every government is supposed to be center or right. Uh, um, but but Brazil is not has not only been a... Uh, uh, kind of left-wing government, but it's also been a government that's had the courage to challenge uh, many other established powers in the world, particularly the, the way it dealt with uh, with um, uh, HIV AIDS in this country and how it challenged international bodies and how it challenged the pharmaceutical companies and how it challenged 
the American government that tried to back up the pharmaceutical companies as if people are supposed to die so that pharmaceutical companies can make uh, great, great amounts of profit. And Brazil was one of the countries that kind of said our people and the health of our people is more important. Uh, if these drugs are available, they should be available for people who need them. Uh, certainly pharmaceutical companies deserve profit, uh, but the question is how much profit and compared to our needs. So let me ask you a question. Um, which country has worse corruption, uh, Brazil or the United States? Um, and let me tell you what I think the difference is. I think the United States is far more corrupt, uh, but the corruption in the United States is legal and the corruption in Brazil is criminal. Um, and criminal corruption is much easier to deal with than legal corruption because criminal corruption, people can be put in jail, they can be fined, they can be punished. Uh, legal corruption, you can't do anything with. Um, so the, um, the situation with regard to elections in the United States and the amount of money that is uh, private money that has been entering American elections is is um, is unacceptable in any democracy uh, and is obscene and yet the supreme court of the united states uh gave carte blanche to do that um the lobbying that goes on uh, in the american congress of course there's lobbying that goes on everywhere in the world um but the extent of lobbying uh and, and maybe i'm a little harsh on the united states not only because I'm Canadian and we're supposed to be harsh on our neighbor, um, but, but because America was the model. Uh, for 200 years, America was the model. America was the place everybody looked up to. Uh, and, and you either went to America uh, because you admired it so much, or else you tried to get your country to imitate America. And, uh, and, and that was... Um, and, and that was common for a long time and now suddenly that model is breaking down and people are looking for other models and the trouble is they're looking in the wrong places they're looking in um, they're looking in uh, isis uh, and other forms of religious fanaticism which is obviously not good they're looking in uh, in populism in many countries where they're looking to populist governments as Egypt did, as Thailand did, as Venezuela did, and so on. Um, in, in the United States itself or in Canada, people are looking to corporate social responsibility uh, with the assumption uh, that if we fix capitalism, we'll fix the world. Uh, and capitalism definitely needs to be fixed. Uh, but, but as I'll talk about, there's more than that that needs to be fi fixed. Um, and uh, uh, or other people in the United States are turning to government as, as people more in the center or the left have always done. They expect government to solve the problems. The trouble today is that governments are so overwhelmed by private interests uh, or by globalization forces which are unregulated um, that, uh, that we're running into, uh, that they're running into huge problems trying to uh, express their independence. The interesting thing about Brazil, and the thing I most admired about Brazil, is Brazil has been uh, prepared to stand up to international forces uh, when it mattered to it. For example, as I mentioned earlier, with the HIV AIDS crisis and other things, Brazil has been one of the most courageous and few courageous governments to stand up to forces that are quite negative. Um, and my fear is that with the current crisis, Brazil will back off and uh, and become uh, and become uh, correct, or become um, um, polite, or become um, uh, disciplined, um, and not play the role it's played. I think that Brazil has more chance of showing the way to a better world than any other country in the world partly because it's large, partly because it's, um, it's been courageous, uh, partly because it's a quite an independent country. The fact that you speak a language that nobody else speaks in, in Latin America, um, almost nobody else speaks in the world except small country of Portugal, 
means that you have a kind of tight kind of society. You're also a society, I think, that, that has a strong sense of community, um, uh, a, a strong sense of what people can do in civil society, which I'll call in a minute uh, the plural sector. Uh, and uh, it's very impressive here, and it's very strong here. The other thing that's most impressive about Brazil, I think, and, and I did an article with Guy Azvedo, who was a, um, who was a, uh, um, uh, why am I looking for the name? People from, from Rio, um, Carioca. Uh, uh, Guy was my doctoral student and he's a Carioca. Um, and we did an article together uh, about the why not people of Brazil. Um, Brazil is a kind of why not country. It's kind of like, yeah, sure, anything goes, whatever, you know, we'll do anything. And, uh, and, um, and too many of the places in the world are why places. What made America, what made the United States so great for 200 years, it was a why not country. It was a country in which anything goes, anything could be done, anything could be conquered. Uh, and America remains a why not country in its private sector, in its business sector. Its entrepreneurship in America is still amazing and fantastic. But in government, America has become a why country. Why should we do that? Why do we need Obamacare? Why should we stop guns? Why should we do this? Why should we do that? And, 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 and there's so much paralysis in the American government today um, uh, that it's sad to watch. And, and Brazil remains I, I think a why not country, not only in business, but especially in its uh, civil society or in its plural sector. There are just so many things going on that are interesting. It's almost reached a point where when I hear somebody talk about some new initiative, some new idea, some new ways of doing things in the population, almost before they tell me where it is, I'm, I'm inclined to say, I'll bet it's Brazil. Um, because maybe half the time it is Brazil. It, it's quite amazing what goes on in this country, and so many interesting things are going on in this country. And that's why I worry, for my sake, for the sake of my children and my grandchildren, I worry that you'll lose that uh, because of the pressures you're now experiencing uh, on the economic side and the criminal corruption side. And, and please don't lose that because we need you everywhere around the world. Um, so I'll get a bit more formal here if I can figure out how this works. I guess if I hit this side, it works. Whoops, a little too well. I, I can't get the middle one. <laughs> That's funny. Ah. So have a good look at that. I bought that book some years ago, The Communist Manifesto. I wanted to look at it and see what Marx and Engels really said. And then I put it aside for a few years. And then I picked it up and I looked at the cover and I said, oh my God, look at this. Do you see what's going on there? It says two for the price of one. <laughs> and Karl Marx must have been turning in his grave when he saw that. But this is the two sides of the world today. You know, we've got the, uh, the, the left-wing communist side, and then slap right in the middle of it, we have the right-wing capitalist side, two for the price of one. Not too uh, serious or damaging, but uh, amusing uh, nonetheless. Um, not long ago, think back. Nobody ever thinks back. I, th I think our collective memories run about two months or maybe two days. Uh, Everybody know about Volkswagen uh, and Volkswagen's uh, games with the diesel engines? Everybody knows about that. Well, do you remember, you knew about it, did you think about it, that if you're not going to buy a Volkswagen next time, will you buy a Chevrolet? Watch out for the ignition switches because they could kill you, okay? Or maybe you should buy a Toyota, but duck. In English you say duck when the airbag comes your way because it could kill you. You remember that? When I tell you, you remember, but, but you probably didn't remember. And you might go out and buy a Toyota because, after all, look what, uh, look what diesel engines are doing now. Um, the problem is not Volkswagen. The problem is not General Motors. The problem is not uh, Toyota. The problem is very widespread. And you know what's a good indication of the problem? Um, the fact that 
there was an article appeared recently in the New York Times, and I had the same feeling actually before they said that, that one of the problems at Volkswagen was the chief executive was obsessed with becoming the biggest car company in the world. It wanted to pass Toyota. So, so he put pressure on people. He didn't tell people to cheat on the tests. He simply put pressure on people which led people, some of them, to cheat on the tests. If they had to sell so many cars, after all, maybe they could sell more this way. Now, how many people remember, if you read the New York Times or the popular press about six or eight years ago, Toyota did exactly the same kind of thing when its chief executive was obsessed with being number one. You know, when its chief executive was being number one. So, so, uh, so, so this is a problem. I, I, I wrote an article recently. I said, this is not a scandal. It's a syndrome. It's a syndrome that cuts across so many businesses. And now we're talking about Germany uh, and General Motors. We're talking about the U.S. and Toyota. We're talking about Japan. And you can go to almost any country. There are wonderful businesses all over the place that don't do these things. But there's more and more of this. And it's becoming extremely serious and dangerous. I think the real... The, the real problem are, are those people in General Motors who knew that these ignition switches were killing people, were killing people, and did nothing about it. That is manslaughter. That is a form of murder. If somebody is dying and you are not intervening to stop it, you are party to that crime. Those people at General Motors belong in jail. You know, there was legislation passed in the U.S. Congress to protect the automobile companies from criminal charges, from criminal prosecutions. So they kind of built, they built a thing around General Motors, around all the automobile companies where the government couldn't prosecute. But, but murder is okay if you do it in an automobile company. Somebody was saying, of course, that, that Volkswagen may be responsible in a way for murder as well, because many, many people die from asthma uh, and other lung diseases, and that is made worse uh, by diesel engines that are spewing out 40 times as much uh, junk as, uh, as they were supposed to be in the tests. So, it wasn't long ago that democracies were proliferating. Think about it, 15, 20 years ago. We were amazed at how many countries were suddenly becoming democratic, suddenly holding elections. It was wonderful. How many of you remember when the, Arctic, when the Arab Spring was flowering and people were in the streets in Tahrir Square in Cairo and in Tunisia and everybody was so enthusiastic about that? Do you remember when developing countries were developing? Uh, and, and in Africa, particularly, a number of countries were, were, and of course Brazil, uh, and many others. Um, and do you remember, yes we can, that you remember, uh, when Barack Obama uh, ran a campaign calling yes we can? When was the last time you heard yes we can? What you hear from Congress these days is no, we cannot. Uh, can't do anything. Um, now you've got turmoil in the Middle East, you've got thugs in presidential palaces, I'm including Putin, and lots of others, and Venezuela, and so on. You've got racism going across Europe, uh, of all places now, and you've got political paralysis in the United States. In the United States, what happened? I think 1989 happened. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, and you know what? It fell on us. It fell on the whole world, because it freed the Eastern Europeans of the scourge of, co of communism, and it created a situation that we're suffering from today. And the, and the, uh, uh, <laughs> have to be very delicate. Um, the, the, um, the conclusion in 1989, particularly in the US, but around the world, was that capitalism had triumphed. Remember that, if you're old enough to remember that. Uh, you don't need gray hair to remember that. Um, capitalism triumphed in 1989. That was the conclusion, uh, and it was dead wrong. It was absolutely and utterly wrong. 
um, what what triumph what uh, the the um, the Eastern European countries collapsed because they were out of balance. Balance triumphed in 1989 in two respects. The Eastern European countries were utterly out of balance on the side of their public on the side of their public sectors. I don't know if moving it back will help. They were utterly out of balance on the side of their their public sectors. Governments controlled so much. Governments controlled big business. Uh, there was no not much private big business, government controlled uh, civil society by making sure that uh, other kinds of organizations couldn't exist. And you see it today in, in, in China, where the communist government is not very happy with independent associations. They try and uh, stop Google and they try and stop uh, Tenement Square protests and so on and so forth. Um, but the other thing that triumphed in 1989 was balance on our side. Uh, that we in the West uh, and the developed and, and wealthy countries in the world, the democratic ones, were rather balanced. We had strong private sectors, no question. We had strong governments, much stronger. And we had strong plural sectors, strong civil society. We were balanced. And if you think about the United States before 1989, after World War II, before 1989, there were welfare programs that were very generous, introduced by L Lyndon Johnson. Uh, tax rates were much higher. Um, the dispar this disparities between the wealthy and the poor were much less than they are now. Um, and yet the country in, the, in that period experienced fantastic development and growth politically, economically, and socially. The country was an American democracy domestically. There was Vietnam, uh, which is not very pretty history, but, but, but America was balanced internally. Um, now look at what's going on. You've got income disparities that are huge. In Brazil, they were starting to shrink. In America, they're growing and growing and growing. Uh, we've got low taxation rates decreasing taxation rates. So Mitt, Mitt Romney, who ran for president, paid less tax than, uh, than his secretary was paying in a percentage. Um, uh, and and all, we've got a Congress that is absolutely frozen, or not Congress is frozen, but a U.S. governmental system that's frozen. America, as I say, is suffering greatly from legal corruption. And it's suffering because we believe that capitalism triumphed, and therefore capitalism is all things good. Uh, a fellow named Fuki, Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History, which has to be the most arrogant book, I think, ever written. Um, and essentially, American, and essentially what he said is that uh, America or the world had reached perfection, had reached perfection thanks to our capitalistic system. Uh, and and uh, and and he proved to be right. Uh, capitalism uh, has triumphed, and 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 unfortunately, which has thrown us out of balance. And we may well see the end of history if we don't do something about global warming. Uh, so we may well see the end of history, but not the way he thought it. So what's this? What's this perfection that we had? Uh, look. I'll get there. We're basically dominated by a dogma that says greed is good. You remember the famous movie about, uh, uh, I forget his name, made this very great speech about greed is wonderful, markets are sacrosanct, property is sacred, and governments are suspect. And that became the overriding model. And as one view of human nature, it makes sense. You can see sort of characteristics of that. You know, greed is good because it does stimulate economic activity and markets are wonderful where there's real, the real uh, competitive markets and property is sacred. This is my jacket and you can't have it. It's mine. Um, and governments are suspect. Of course, governments do all kinds of things that we don't, don't like. As one view of human nature, it makes sense. As the view of human nature, it's nonsense. As the view of human nature, which is what traditional economic theory was taught to so many people, 
it's complete nonsense that anybody could believe that that's all there is to human nature. You know, economists who say there's no such a thing as empathy, there's no such a thing as generosity, generosity I want to say to them, what kind of mother did you have? <laughs> like, did you have a mother? I mean, mothers are generous and empathetic. I mean, most mothers are, are generous and empathetic, and they care only about their children. But, uh, but these guys must have had awful mothers if they think there's no such a thing as generosity or, or empathy. Um, so the result, um, America's leading this, but it's by no means alone. And there are people all over the world driving this kind of agenda. Uh, uh, but look at some statistics. In the United States, incarceration rates, the highest in the world, um, uh, in jail. Uh, obesity, huge, huge in America. Drug use, very, very high in the United States. Voter turnout, surprisingly low. Uh, income disparities, growing. Uh, and the most shocking of all is social mobility. For 200 years, people moved to America for social mobility so that their children, they arrived poor, they were prepared to be poor. Even these mothers came with the idea that they would be poor if their children could be wealthy and successful. Uh, these ungenerous mothers, the ones who, at least the ones who didn't have economists as uh, children. Um, uh, people moved to America because of social mobility. Well, look at the figures on of social mobility today. America's significantly behind uh, many of the developed countries now. Canada, which has always been a very democratic country, but not as famous for social mobility, I think the last figures are that a child has four times as much chance of getting ahead in Canada as that child does in the United States. I'm not saying America's all bad. I'm saying America's in the front of a trend that is happening in the entire world, and believe me, it's coming here, as it's been coming everywhere else. And it 10 years ago when we got a government that looks very much like George Bush's government in the United States and 60% of the Canadian population that split their votes between two center and left-wing parties were shocked by what happened in our own country. Our own country was sold basically and now we're in an election to try and correct that. So, <clears throat> so it's not just America but America's taking the lead and unless somebody stops it, it's coming everywhere. Globalization has no significant regulation. So global companies have a lot of freedom with very little regulation. And the international agencies that should be controlling this are cheerleaders for all this economic dogma. The IMF, the World Bank, the, the OECD, the, uh, the uh, World Bank, the, uh, what is it, IMF, World Bank, OECD, and the World Trade organization. You know, the World Trade Organization heard a case uh, some years ago about um, uh, uh, genetically modified foods and, um, and uh, the Europeans want to stop genetically modified foods and some countries, including Canada, I'm hesitant to say, took them to the World Trade Organization court and lost. The World Trade Organization said you have no right to stop this. Well, what the hell is the World Trade Organization doing deciding on health issues? Where was the World Health Organization? All our powerful international agencies are cheerleaders for this kind of economic dogma. They may have moderated their stand somewhat, but they still stand for that economic view. They don't stand for social needs. They stand for economic needs. So that's the world we're living in. Um, so, we have to go from exploiting resources uh, to exploring our resourcefulness. Uh, I am not a human resource. I'm a human being. I am not human capital. I am not a human asset. I'm a human being. And we've got to get rid of demeaning vocabulary. So this is the political world as we've known it for two, for over a century, when, when in the French assemblies, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ancien regime, the establishment sat on the right, and the commoners sat on the left. And ever since then, 
politics has been a straight line between left and right and and between public and private between communism and capitalism between Karl Marx and Adam Smith not the Adam Smith of his, his most important book but a few paragraphs of the Adam Smith of the wealth of nations um, because if you read the rest of Adam Smith it's not consistent with that view um, uh, nationalization of industry on one side privatization of industry on the other side um, and what we have in many countries now is either a pendulum politics as France has swinging from left to right so you go from Sarkozy to Hollande back to Sarkozy back to Hollande and, and, and you're swinging back from left to right and nothing much changes or you have what's in the United States which is paralysis in the political center so you can't get things done in the political center that's kind of what we're facing politically so whoops so how about that um, the, there's a problem with the PowerPoint it's the 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 last words are hidden underneath but I'll I'll tell you we need to take the straight line and fold it over into a circle okay we need to look at at society as a stool like a stool you sit on um, and you can't sit on one leg. Communism tried to sit on one leg, the public sector leg. And America today is trying to sit on one leg, which is the private sector leg. And China is trying to sit on two legs, which is the you know business and government. And they're all unstable. Um, but a society has to sit on three legs. And, and one leg is the public sector and one leg is the private sector and it's missing but one leg is what I call the plural sector you know it as civil society or NGOs non-government organizations or um, or uh, the third sector as if it's third rate and so on a healthy society balances strong respected governments um, responsible enterprises and uh, and robust community organizations in the plural sector the plural sector is largely community not exclusively um, <laughs> there we go so what do I mean by the plural sector I basically mean organizations that are not owned by government and they're not owned by private investors there are two kinds they're owned by their members you could say a church is owned by its members um, uh, but cooperatives are owned by their members uh, uh, cooperatives. Do you know how much membership of cooperatives there is in the United States? The United States has about 310 million people and about 350 million cooperative memberships. America is a land of cooperatives, not just of businesses. Of course, cooperatives are businesses, um, but America is significantly a land of cooperatives, as is every country. Uh, but we don't talk about it. We know it, but we don't think about it. The, the plural sector is hidden. It's, it's forgotten because it's, there's no room on a straight line between left and right. There's no room for the plural sector. There's only room for private and public. There's no room for the plural sector. But if we turn it around uh, and make it into a circle, there's room for it. And why do I call it plural? For two reasons. First of all, the variety of organizations is huge um, and second of all uh, we need a word so that we can say public private plural and recognize that plural has to take its place alongside public and private um, uh, there are also social movements social associations in the plural sector like social movements uh, uh, as we saw on, on Wall Street or Tahrir Square in Cairo and social initiatives which are ideas to uh, to try and change things somebody said there's a million social initiatives in the world today he wrote that five years ago there's probably two million now probably everybody in this room is involved with something maybe you're helping to feed the poor or driving some elder people around who need help or you could be doing all kinds of things uh, my guess is everybody in this room has probably been involved with a plural sector organization or five of them this week if you went to the YMCA uh, to swim if you were uh, if you did, gave money to Greenpeace if you shopped in a cooperative uh, 
uh, we're all very involved, and yet we don't think of that sector. There's only two, public, private, and yet, and yet there's three. Um, when de Tocqueville wrote a book, uh, two books, a uh, uh, two-part book called Democracy in America, and he wrote it in the 1930s. He, as a Frenchman, he visited America. Sorry, 1830s, minor difference, <laughs> quibble. <laughs> when he wrote in the 1830s, 100 and... 80, 90 years ago, almost, almost two centuries ago, he wrote that associations, and he meant plural sector associations, were key to American democracy, were key to American democracy. So he had this idea of three sectors long before anybody else did, and he saw that as key to American democracy. Brazil is a land of plural sector initiatives. I'm amazed, I said it earlier, but I'm always amazed at how much goes on. When it was dealing with HIV AIDS, you had organizations of hemophiliacs, you had or organizations of gay people, you had um, uh, uh, government involved. You, you, ha you had not only plural sector, but you had cooperation between public, public private, and plural. I spent this morning at, uh, at uh, FIO... Um, Field crews, uh, your healthcare organization, which is technically public sector, but kind of runs like plural sector. It seems to have a lot of autonomy, and uh, and it was involved with developing the uh, the drugs for HIV/AIDS in this country, uh, in in opposition to the drug companies and the American government that tried to stop Brazil from doing it. Um, I went to a conference. Um, Ricardo Semler, who's a friend of mine, um, I, I ran a group called DNA Brazil, where he bought, brought the 50, uh, 50 of the most uh, well-known thinkers of Brazil together every year to talk about issues. And somebody at that conference, I forget the name of the organization, but it's the organization that seizes farmland of rich people that's not being used, and they occupy the farmland and grow their crops on this private farmland, and um, and uh, uh, and he was giving out the jams and jellies that they made uh, in this farmland. Uh, in where I come from, that guy would be in jail. Uh, in in Brazil, he's like a hero. So for some people, anyway, not everybody, not the landowners, I guess. So so what goes on in this country is absolutely amazing, and that's what saddens me. If the country gets the disease that other countries are getting and goes out of balance. This is a balanced, this is a balanced country. You, you have a very strong private sector. You have a very activist public sector, and you have an amazing, uh, absolutely amazing plural sector in this country. Um, I never cease to be amazed at how, uh, how activist it is. Um, each of the sectors by itself is dangerous. So if it's all private se public sector, you have communism. You can't balance the society on that one leg. If it's all private sector, you have capitalism, which is no proving no better. It's too one-sided. And if it's just plural sector, it's a kind of Nazism. Nazism was a community-based organization in Germany or in Italy. Uh, in a sense, it was a plural sector kind of organization. So you can't have any sector dominating, no matter which. Um, I love business. I think business is wonderful. I drive a wonderful Honda car. I've got a terrific iPhone. I eat at wonderful restaurants. I love the private sector in the private sector, supplying me with goods and services. If a, if a businessman comes to me and says, I want to be more socially responsible, what should I do? I say, start by getting your company out of my government. Start by getting your company out of my government. You have no business interfering. You as an individual have as much right as I as an individual have. You as a company, you with money, have no, no, more, no more business uh, influencing government than some guy in the street. Uh, that's corporate social responsibility. Stick to your own place, which is goods and services for business, protection for government and community institutions. For the, uh, for the plural sector. Um, so how do we, I, I'll, I'll finish uh, quickly, but 
um, how do we get radical renewal? We're not going to get it from corporate social responsibility. I applaud it. I think we need more of it. I think every company should do what it can to be socially responsible. But in today's world, there is so much corporate social irresponsibility that it won't compensate. It won't compensate. What Volkswagen just did will not be compensated by Walmart going green. What Walmart does to unions is a lot more significant than what Walmart does going green. So, so, and governments will not get us out of this mess now because governments are so overwhelmed by private sector forces or so overwhelmed by, uh, by globalization forces that they can't do anything. Canada drops its tax rate to, uh, to 15% for corporations and now we have a, a center-left uh, opposition party saying we'll raise it to 17 percent. I'm thinking 15 is the lowest in the world and we're going to go up to 17. Wow, that's going to make a big difference. This is the world we live in. I think we have to look to the plural sector for change. And that means you and that means me and that means us together. What, what concerns me about the plural sector is, as I say, it's huge, it's significant, we're all involved with it, but as a force, it's extremely weak. Greenpeace and all the others were in Rio de Janeiro for the last global warming conference, and look what they accomplished, zero. We had the G7 meeting, the seven significant economies of the world meeting, uh, and what was their result? That we will get rid of fossil fuels by 2010, uh, by 2100. We will get rid of fossil fuels by 2100. And the press reported this without laughing. The press reported this without laughing. In 85 years, we'll get rid of fossil fuels. These, these politicians were sitting there. Are they going to be there in 85 years saying, see, we did it? There's going to be 20 or 30 governments in every one of those countries. Nobody's responsible for anything. And yet even the CBC, which is a very liberal kind of network in Canada, um, even the CBC was reporting this as if it was serious. You have to laugh. If it wasn't so sad, you have to laugh. 85 years to get rid of fossil fuels. We'll be dead. We'll be dead. Um, so the big question for me, and I'll, kind of, uh, I'll end in a minute, uh, say some words about Brazil, but the big question for me is how do we get our act together to rebalance society? How does the plural sector work and how does it work with people, what a friend of mine calls the good folks of America, and he's a right-wing, kind of moderate, conservative guy, and, and he talks about the good folks of America. How do the good folks of America work together with the plural sector uh, and government to uh, rebalance society. So some quick words on Brazil and that and then um, I, I talked about balance in Brazil. I talked about the vibrancy of the plural sector. People refer to Brazil as a developing country. You know what? When it comes to the plural sector, Brazil is a hell of a lot more developed than any other country I know. Brazil is the most developed country, I think, socially, in terms of the plural sector. Um, I, I talked about the why not people of Brazil, uh, people who, you know, I, I met a woman in Montreal, a Brazilian woman, and she says, you know, when you Canadians get together on Saturday night, you have to know what restaurant you're going to and what time you're going and what movie you're going to or what theater you're going to. She said, we Brazilians just get together and say, what do we feel like doing? Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to try and pronounce that. I'm going to read my cheating. It says that I should say, Zay Shin Yu. Something like that. But you know what I mean. <laughs> America was the why not people. Americans were the why not people of the world. They still are in the private sector. American enterprise and entrepreneurship is amazing. Absolutely amazing. But, but, the, um, but, uh, but in the public sector, and the plural sector is not that. But in the but Americans were the why not people. America could do anything. And now suddenly there's this pall over the country, this kind of, we can't, you know, we can't deal with our problem, we can't get rid of guns, we can't do this, we can't do that. And, and it's sad. 
and Brazil still has that. And so my message to you is don't lose it. You've got something that is so unique in the world and so powerful in the world and so necessary for everybody, yourselves and everybody else. Don't lose it. Uh, so let me just conclude. Tom Paine wrote a famous pamphlet for the American Revolution um, that, that helped to stimulate the American Revolution. And he said, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. And he was right. They did start the world over again. Well, we have to do it again. And why not Brazil? Thank you. So I would like to thank uh, Henry for this uh, inspiring and, uh, and very positive words. And I would like to open for, uh, for the public for questions. There's one. <laughs> Way in the back. Way in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Rafael, and I work for Rio de Janeiro City Hall. Uh, in Brazil, legislation uh, makes uh, almost impossible for public sector and private sector, maybe the plural sector you said, to cooperate. What do, what do you think that can be made in Brazil to uh, make strong the cooperation between the, those sectors? Yeah, no, it's a wonderful question. You know, in the, my understanding of the HIV AIDS crisis was that there was cooperation uh, and a lot of support and a lot of cooperation. So, you know, I, I'm a mixed feelings because I always feel that, that the sectors, when they cooperate, have to cooperate on an equal basis. Uh, business is often so strong that when business makes a partnership with government, uh, it's not cooperation the way it should be. You know, the greatest PPP, public-private partnership, was what Eisenhower, the president of America, called the military-industrial complex. That was a partnership between the government and private industry in the, in the armaments industry. It wasn't a good idea. But the HIV-AIDS crisis was an example here of how people could cooperate because everybody had a friend or somebody or a relative, uh, whether they were hemophiliacs or gay or whatever it was, uh, everybody had a friend, they knew somebody. So it was a crisis and it was recognized by everybody. So when it's important enough, we cooperate. Well, we need to wake up because it's becoming important enough. Just global warming itself is becoming important enough. And, 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 and there are all kinds of other things, you know, the famous expression, I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, well, now the expression should be, I'll see it when I believe it. Because if we believe and understand what's going on, we will wake up and stop the worst of it before it carries on. Uh, but, but, but so a good crisis always helps. You know, in, how did people get together in India to throw the British out? Uh, it, 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 was Gandhi responsible or would there have been another Gandhi if it wasn't Gandhi, you know? And the salt marches just fired people up uh, and they acted and they succeeded. What happened in the United States? People got together, they cooperated. They threw the, they threw the British out too. So, so when people start to realize what's going on, um, but I also think, and we just had this discussion in our IMPM class, you know, it, it, it will take decent people across the sectors because whether you're a business person or a government uh, administrator or somebody working in the plural sector, like F, FGV is a, is a plural sector organization, nobody owns it, um, uh, it, 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 um, it, it will take the good folks, to quote my friend, it will take the good folks working with each other, not institutionally uh, so much, but that too, but working with each other. So, so there are companies that do care, and there are people in business who do care. They're not necessarily the ones who have to answer to the stock market every 
three months. Um, um, but there's lots of people who do care and do do things, and they have to find a way of cooperating. Gates took his private money and put it into the plural sector and created the Gates Foundation. Um, so it's a question of good people doing good things, and there are good people in all the sectors. There are good people in all the sectors. There are bad people in all the sectors. Hitler was a plural sector person. So there are good and bad people in all the sectors. It's not a good answer, but when we wake up, it'll be answered. I think it's a good, a good answer. Thank you. Okay. Heinz Sandler, I'm a businessman and a student. Good. I'm, I'm really surprised on your position of Brazil. Mm -hmm. I lived in the United States and I lived in Europe. But the growing of these countries were always based also on leadership. It's my personal opinion that we all have a lack of leadership here in Brazil, which gives these efforts together in one common result. How do you see this? Well, you may be surprised or upset by what I'm going to say. Uh, leadership is certainly important, but community ship is much more important. The trouble with leadership is you say leader, you mean one person. One person's going to do it. We need leadership and everything will come together. And of course, it's always the answer because if things go well, we must have had a great leader. And if things go badly, we must have had a bad leader. But, but you know, was, as I said, was Gandhi responsible for, for the independence of India? Well, you might be inclined to say that, but would you say George Washington? was responsible for the independence of America, so was Jefferson, so was Madison, so were lots of other people. Franklin, lots of them. I, I believe leadership is important. I think it's important in the service of community. I think it's important in the service of community, and I'm completely against this cult of individualism because the problem in society today is too much individualism. We, we, we need a combination of individual needs, collective needs, and community needs, and those have to be balanced. Collective needs represented by the public sector, community needs by the plural sector, and individual leadership needs by the private sector. But we need to combine them. So yes, leadership is important, but not, not with this obsession with individuals. And some person is going to come down from the skies and save us all. I am not a big fan of that belief. I think those people appear when a society is ready for it. And if it's not going to be one, it's going to be another. Uh, that, that's my belief. So, yeah, I mean, there's wonderful people have done one. The Cruz in Fio Cruz, uh, obviously an amazing man who created a wonderful organization. Um, but it's never just one person. Hi, Professor, here, here. Uh, my name is Marcela, and I work in the plural sector. I have a question about Jeitinho for you. Question uh, about? Jeitinho, okay. the word that oh, you tried to Pronounce to properly, yeah. okay. No problem, we get it. Uh, Jeitinho is one thing that distinguishes Brazilian people and what our way to be. Uh, on one hand, it is very important uh, to empower us uh, to be more flexible, to face the problems and solve them. On the other hand, uh, it makes uh, everything, including laws, rules, uh, very fluid and easy to disrespect. Yeah. Uh, you say that it's a uh, uh, special quality for us. So how do you with these two sides of Jeitinho. Uh, no, no, you're right. I mean, it's, 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 it's a way to cheat. It's a way to, uh, to go around what uh, public needs and so on and so forth. But it's all, you have another expression called breaking a branch, eh? Uh, forget, what, what, what's yeah, that? Give it all back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I appreciate that one especially because I spent many years what we call bushwhacking on skis, yeah. 
going in the forest on skis. And we had to break a lot. We call it bushwhacking, not because we whack the bushes, but because the bushes whack us. <laughs> because a friend goes in front and pushes it away, and I'm behind, and bang. So, so we have bushwhacking. So, so I like that expression too. Yes, it cuts both ways. Um, uh, but, but, but a strong sense of community says, hey, wait a minute, I don't like that one. That's not in the spirit of what we need. And people have to speak to each other and say, sorry, we don't like that. But when people go around and find a way to beat bad forces or to beat things that are harming us, then it's good. So I like good, whatever it's called, <laughs> and, and not bad. But of course, that's my, you know, I have my own preferences as to what's good and what's bad. But... Uh, so yes, everything has two sides. The plural sector has two sides. It's community engagement on one side and it's Nazism on the other side with boots, you know, boots and murdering people and so on. So everything has two sides, but we've got to learn how to exploit or how to make use of and explore the positive sides of these things. It's a part of our tools to change the world. So you're right, not all one-sided, I agree. Yeah. Hi, my name is Claudette. I work for the federal government, the health ministry, the regulatory agency. And I see much of ethical dimension in your ideas. You have just talked about uh, Volkswagen and its attitude about uh, trying to fraud the pollution uh, control. Uh, I would like you to, to talk a little bit more specifically about how do you see this ethical dimension in your ideas? Well, you know, there's a, there's a, a kind of breakdown of ethics to some extent. I mean, the Volkswagen story was shocking uh, because it was so overt, it was so calculated. It took months or years to do this, and they kept doing it, and then when the American Environmental Protection Agency challenged them. They denied it all and lied and, and accused them of interfering. It, the arrogance was, 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 was mind-blowing. So, so there's a certain breakdown in ethics, I think, because of the greed in society. The economists have told us that greed is good. Well, if greed is good, why shouldn't I cheat? Or, as I say, because I, I don't know if I discussed it enough, but it's the legal corruption that bothers me. As I said, you, you can put criminals in jail, but legal corruption is the problem. When a chief executive of a company accepts to be paid 400 times as much as the workers, what that person is saying is, I'm 400 times more important than you. That is not leadership. That's the opposite of leadership. Those people should not be in those positions. They're announcing that they're so much more important than anybody else, and, and that's a form of ethical breakdown, moral breakdown. They're not breaking the law, uh, but it's a breakdown nonetheless. And what happened with the banking in the United States in, you know, after 2007, 2008, the things that were going on. I went to a panel in Davos, uh, and, and, and the panel, Davos, the World Economic Forum in, in Davos, Switzerland, and the panel was called the Global Corporation Savior or scapegoat. I mean, think about that for a minute. Savior or scapegoat, some choice. Um, uh, so it was completely biased in its title, and they didn't even realize it, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and you had major business people on that panel uh, talking about it's a few bad apples. This was 2006, I think. It's a few bad apples. The chairman of, uh, of uh, Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley, was there more JP more JP Morgan Chase was there talking about a few bad apples read about what this company was just accused of at the very time when he was making those statements a few bad apples but they were playing games with the mortgages but there was the others a few bad apples the world is full of a lot of bad apples these days and as you say if you have a bunch of apples and you put a bad one in the other ones are going to get bad so so there's a moral decay that is awful. It's awful. You see it in your own government. You, know, you see it in your own political parties. Uh, uh, but you see it all over the place. 
and, and some of it is, is absolutely shocking. Tobacco companies that are using legal, phony legal means to stop Asian countries from trying to stop women from smoking cigarettes. And they take them to court because there's these tribunals in the trade pacts that enable them to sue. Companies can sue governments in trade pacts for interfering with their profits. So every time Canada tries to do something about drugs, we have American pharmaceutical companies suing our government. It's, it's completely crazy what's going on now. Um, and, uh, and, and then you get, Bloom, I think it was Bloomberg and two very, very wealthy Americans, Bloomberg and maybe Gates, uh, I'm not sure it was Gates, um, giving money to Asian governments to fight this, these lawsuits so they could fight against the tobacco companies. And I'm saying, why doesn't a Supreme Court, why doesn't somebody take it to a Supreme Court and say that these trade tribunals are, are in contradiction to our democratic rights as citizens and no government has the right to sign a trade pact that gets in the way of our democratic rights and throw those tribunals out in, uh, in Supreme Courts and get rid of them instead of giving money to countries to spend it, what a waste of money to spend it suing, suing uh, Philip Morris for what it's doing to, uh, to keep women smoking. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy what is going on in the world today. Volkswagen is just the tip of the iceberg. You don't know about icebergs here uh, in Brazil, but we, in Canada we have, we have icebergs. <laughs> so. Hello, Professor. Uh, my name is Carolina. I work with education. And um, when we have an expectation to balance uh, these three sectors, um, I think we should also expect like our community to be prepared uh, to think, to have the knowledge and to think collectively. And um, do you think education has a big role in this? And how could education um, help us get to this plural sector where people um, know what they're doing. If education teaches people to think and not write exams, uh, then it, sure. If we teach people to think and look at things thoughtfully and, and consider things, yes. It's amazing how many intelligent, educated people don't think. Um, we were at a dinner party the other night and this was a lawyer who was a very uh, successful lawyer and we have a election campaign going on now and the conservative party is trying to say that the head of the liberal party is too inexperienced and isn't capable and isn't strong enough and he's not ready and so on and so forth it's negative advertising and he repeated all that that's why we can't elect the liberal party and i thought have you listened to the guy himself have you listened to what he's saying because he's very impressive. But the conservatives are trying to paint him as incapable and too young and so on. And yet when you listen to him, he's quite amazing. And he surprises people who are against him who listen. This guy never bothered to listen to him. Never bothered to listen to him. He bought the dogma. Uh, we have too much of that. I don't want people to be left or right or anything else. I simply want them to think. And as I was sort of suggesting before, I know people who are right of center, who, but they think, they think. One of my friends calls himself moderately conservative, uh, and he loves my book. He loves my book because he thinks that he's American. He thinks the fat cats, as he put it, have taken over, and he wants the good people of America to act. Just want people to think, that's all. Okay. This will be the last question, because Professor Minsberg has a very busy agenda. So, okay, go on. Um, I'm, I'm Lucia Mazzoni from the state government. Considering your concerns about the current directions from Brazil, 
do you think that the responsibility to be more plural is relying on government because of the legislations and so on or do you think this is a, a mixed responsibility there to be more plural for brazil the people in general to be more plural it's interesting because you know there are some countries france i think is like that i'm a huge fan of france i spent years and years living in france um and yet i think when something becomes popular in france almost everybody follows it you know in, in america if you didn't watch the super bowl to talk in the office about the super bowl kind of what's wrong with you you're not like you know there's there's a certain conformity in those two countries i don't get a feeling of conformity here i get a feeling of, of very widespread pluralism which is i think a lot of people just think for themselves they work it out they figure it out for themselves i think the british are like that uh, i think the indians are like that in india uh, the, the educated people really think for themselves so you want plurality of thought but you want people to th think about things and be educated to think about things and not to buy you know dogma you know if you study economics in the traditional way, somehow you're supposed to believe that markets are wonderful and governments are terrible. Uh, we'll get rid of the police force. We'll get rid of the army. Uh, that, I, I went to a party in Virginia, and um, it was in rural Virginia, and there were a lot of kind of very right-wing people there, and they were all kind of around me talking about how bad government is and how bad taxes are. And at one point I said, every one of you spent your career in the military. Every one of you is on pension from the military. You never earned one cent that didn't come from taxes. And it never occurred to them. It never occurred to them that they would never have earned one penny in their whole lives if not for taxes. And yet they were going on and on about taxes and government, and they were government employees. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. You know, after this latest shooting in the United States, they interviewed a young woman who was right in the, near it and was traumatized by it. And they said, so what do you think we should do? And she said, oh, we need more guns. We definitely need more guns so that we can kill these people. I don't know anybody who engaged in mass killing who was shot by a local person. They were all shot by the police. So everybody's supposed to have guns. Well, where are all these guns when these people are shooting people? They're doing the killing. They're not killing the uh, the terrorists. They're they're they're. It's it's awful. People buy this nonsense, and they don't think. It's very dangerous. It's fantastic. I would like then to, to thank you, Professor Mintzberg, for this fantastic speech and this, this very open discussion. And uh, I'd like just to invite everybody for a cocktail uh, outside the, this room. Thank you very much.